their separation is indeterminate relative to the universe beyond. It can only be measured in terms of, of the number of particle diameters. We have also introduced meaning to motion since the particle, the separation measured in the particle diameters can vary, but with only two particles if the separation varied, we could not tell whether the particles had moved or perhaps only changed diameter, shrunk or expanded. Either, either would give the same result. We can also now detect spinning. Note that the two particles cannot see or influence each other in any way except by collision. Since our otherwise empty universe definitely contains uh, you know, no photons or agents to produce forces or actions at a distance, such as electromagnetism or gravitation. By these constructions, we begin to see the origins of what are called inertial forces and the importance of a frame of reference to the properties of the universe we live in. We also begin to see why it must be that scale and motion are relative, as relativity shows not is not absolute are not absolute in nature we have just seen that absolute motion has no meaning without a frame of reference and that some substance must must logically provide such a reference frame this uh, gives us a basis for looking at a very famous dilemma called zeno's paradox <laughs> Zeno's paradox deals with the ultra-small structure of space and time. Uh, the paradox can be expressed as, for example, to move from point A to point B, one must first complete the trip to the midpoint. Having reached that far, one must next reach the new midpoint of the remaining distance. But however, how far one has traveled, one must first travel half the remaining distance before one can travel all of it. Hence, one can never reach point B, because an infinite number of half the distance steps are required. Since this contradicts everyday experience, it's called a paradox. It might be, of course, that space is not infinitely dividable, that there is a smallest possible increment of distance, but this leads to all sorts of uh, conceptual problems. Consider point X and Y, separated by the smallest possible increment of distance. Now consider another point, Z, also separated from X by the minimum possible distance, but in a slightly different direction. Then the distance between point Y and Z is less the minimum possible distance, contradicting the starting assumption. But if space were grid-like, so that adjacent cells had no overlap, then motion in any desired direction would not be possible, unless one took a zigzag path from grid point to grid point. Clearly, the postulate of a minimum possible distance is problematical. If time is treated like just another dimension, a fourth dimension of space, the same remarks might be extended to include the concept the, the concept of a minimum possible time unit. Or we may make a separate argument about time. If, if there were a minimum possible time unit, then all existing substance would have one condition at one moment and some slightly different condition at the next time moment. By hypothesis, there is no possible interval in time, nor any moment in between when anything could have happened to provide a transition from the first condition to the second. It is therefore just exactly as if everything existing, existing at the first time moment ceased to exist and then was created from nothingness in its new condition at the next time instant. Viewed in this way, it may be seen that the body is at every instant at some specific point on a space-time line. The points in the interval can be put into, into a one-to-one -one correspondence with numbers between 0 and 1. By placing these in one-to-one -one 
correspondence with the physical concepts of space, time, and mass, we can reason by extension that finite intervals and masses may actually be composed of an infinite number of divisions, and conversely, that an infinite number of divisions may have a finite sum. So, even though the distance traveled by the body in zero time is zero, it is nonetheless possible to cross a finite distance in a finite time, each interval consisting of an infinite number of time instants and space points. Well, to put this conclusion more strongly, it is possible for substances to be unchanging at every instant, yet changed after a finite interval, and that that the, that the accumulation of the more discrete transitions or changes or changes sums up to a specific change only if there are an infinite number of steps in the interval. There is another form of Zeno's paradox which applies to masses. Uh, if bodies are infinitely dividable, then contact is impossible. For example, when microscopic bodies seem to touch, they actually consist of mostly empty space at the atomic level. So it must be their atoms which actually touch. But atoms are themselves composed of smaller particles and mostly empty space. So it must be these smaller constituents which actually touch. But if matter is infinitely dividable, this argument can be prolonged indefinitely and nothing can ever actually touch. One might use this argument to conclude that there is a smallest possible unit of matter or substance. Imagine such a unit particle. It must be utterly uncomposed. It therefore cannot be broken or neither divided, uh, nor even deformed by spin or collision, since these are properties of bodies composed of yet smaller particles. What then are we to assume will happen when two such unit particles collide? What density will the unit particle have? Indeed, will there be anything inside it at all? What would the unit particle surface be like? Could it be hollow? With what thickness of shell? Would two colliding unit particles have to stick, since they can't rebound elastically? If they rebound it what, with what resultant velocity? Would the unit particles be spherical in shape? Why would they have finite space dimensions, yet infinite dimension in time? Or do they come into and go out of existence constantly? Where and when would they appear and disappear? It should be apparent from these considerations that postulating a minimum possibility of substance is no more logically acceptable than a minimum possibility of space or time. Substance must be infinitely dividable as in must space and time, or else the paradoxes quickly lead to unsolvable logical dilemmas. But how then can matter ever experience contact, if, if everything which might experience contact is itself composed of smaller substances? The resolution of this paradox would seem to be analogous to that for space-time. If the substance of bodies always gets denser, more substance per unit volume, at smaller and smaller scales, then in the limit as dimensions uh, approach zero, density approaches infinity and substances approaching each other must make contact. At infinite density, they cannot be transparent to other substances. In the real universe, the density of matter greatly increases as scale decreases. Therefore, the ratio of mass to volume in electrons is enormously greater than the same ratio for matter in ordinary human experience, which in turn is enormously greater than the ratio for the entire visible universe. Contact is therefore possible for infinitely dividable matter, as long as the smaller and smaller particles continue, continue to increase in density with sufficient rapidity without limit. <laughs>
it must approach infinite damage.